Hey everybody, CVH here of BetweenTheLanes.net coming at you today with an exciting update video. Uh, for those of you who may remember, a couple days ago on this YouTube channel, I posted a video of some speculative nerfs that might be coming to Elder Scrolls Legends. And as you can see, I'm on the official Bethesda site, and what came to pass is that the nerfs are actually true. Uh, so, you know, hopefully you'll remember that video. I only posted it three days ago. Uh, but if you don't, go check it out. Uh, I go over like what the nerfs are. Obviously, they're explained in this article that was just posted today as well. Uh, but in this video, since the nerfs are actually true, what I decided to do was take a take a few minutes. I don't know how long this video is actually going to be, and discuss what I thought, what I think, you know, more in depth about every nerf, and more so what I think it means for the metagame because. I've told you guys before, you might remember me saying that uh, I only got to play basically right when the game uh, began, get it right, right about a week before open beta came to be, and obviously there were a lot of nerfs in closed beta, but this is the largest set of nerfs that I have actually going, been having been played through, uh, since the only nerfs I think during my time playing the game were the Soul Rest, Marshall, Merc, Water Savage nerfs, but I also did a video about that, but obviously all of these... Uh, and there are some buffs in here as well, not just nerfs, I don't want to mislead you guys. Uh, but mostly nerfs, obviously all of these are going to shake up the meta a ton compared to just the, the Soul Rest, Martial, Murkwater, Savage nerfs, which only really affected one or two decks. Uh, but without further ado, let's get into this. Obviously this is going to be a pretty big meta change. So I also have the Between the Lanes meta snapshot here to reference. Not that I'm trying to self-promote, although I am. Be sure to check out the meta snapshot. Uh, but a lot of these um, do affect the, uh, the tiers in those in those things so we could speculate about where decks might be moving to so i can talk about a few things that i think that uh, overall bethesda and direwolf did a great job on with these nerfs a few things that i'm surprised i don't see and you know what it basically means the first thing that i really want to talk about that they did a great job of uh, is nerfing agility now i mentioned there are some buffs uh, not really any to speak of in agility although elena does get a buff the the, the multicolor uh, minor buff that Nolina can now hit face. Don't really need to talk about that too much, doesn't really change the nature of things, but what does change the nature of things is that three of the most ubiquitous agility cards in the game have seen what look like pretty effective nerfs. We have Tazcad the Packmaster to 9 cost, House Kinsman to a 3-2 instead of a 3-3, and the Werebat to a 4-2 instead of 4-3. Obviously Moonlight Werebat is the one with prophecy that you know people could play in competitive decks. Twilight is the one from the story mode. So Moonlight Werebat effectively went from 4-3 to 4-2. So now House Kinsman and Werebat trade less efficiently, as this description states. Die to Firebolt, Tazcad is just still very strong and resilient, won't be as consistently devastating as it used to be when it comes down just a bit too early for most decks to deal with. And that extra burst damage, of course, when you have a card with charge, you have to make sure it's balanced appropriately. So, there are two green cards that I want to talk about that weren't on this list. We have Ungolem the Listener, uh, which puts the Brotherhood Assassins into your deck, and Soul Rest Marshal. Obviously, Soul Rest Marshal's already been nerfed. Uh, if you've heard me talk about nerfs at all, you know I still think Solarist Marshall is in a vacuum, the most powerful card in the game. Uh, there's just the fact that it can get itself off of its own effect reduced to zero, so you can go Solarist Marshall into Solarist Marshall into something else. While I'm surprised that um, that card didn't get touched, and that Ungolem's Brotherhood Assassins weren't made slightly worse, like maybe Tutus, this is what we really have to talk about, is like what makes a card overpowered and what needs to be touched. Because obviously those two cards are still incredibly powerful. I'd be shocked to talk to anyone at Direwolf Digital who didn't think they were incredibly powerful. But the thing about all three of these cards, that they also share with Ungolem actually, is that they're used max copies in every single competitive agility deck. If we go down the list, uh, we look at tier 1 for example, midrange, archer, uh, not so much ramp scout with House Kinsman because it's a different style of deck, action assassin, prophecy assassin, uh, midrange scout, definitely. All of those decks are going to play a Tazcad, an Ungolem, three Kinsmen, and three Werebats. And while Solarist Marshal is incredibly powerful, it's not quite as ubiquitous as those cards. You're not seeing it all the time. Only certain decks really want its effect. You know, there are there are some Assassin decks that play Solarist Marshal, but a lot of them are just too aggressive. And, you know, the slower ramp decks don't want to play it either. But every single deck wanted to play these. Not all those, just this, this, these three cards. Fantastic finisher and fantastic earlier game. So the problem with that is that it does limit design space, right? Because not only are they super powerful, but it'll be hard pressed to ever print something or release something since it's an online card game. It'll be hard pressed for them to ever release something that pushes them out of decks, which means things are going to look stale. It's not necessarily a problem that some cards you're seeing forever if they're you know if they're more fun, but if you're seeing the same upsetting card over and over and over again until the end of time or until we ever get set rotations, that that'll 
push people out of the game. So if a card is leading to some some more upsetting games, such as a very early Tazcat or a Werebat in the first rune, or Kinsman's effect completely dictating the flow of life and making Solaris Marshall better by default, if a card is that good, uh, you have to you have to find a way to put its power level sort of in line with other things. Obviously, there are some cards like Lightning Bolt and Piercing Javelin, which are you know nearly as ubiquitous. You see Lightning Bolt in every single deck that runs blue, and you see Piercing Javelin in every single non-aggro deck that runs yellow. Uh, but even though they're so good, and even though Lightning Bolt in particular is played in so many decks, they're not necessarily as dictating of the game's flow as, as cards like these, and not as overpowered. So you don't really mind seeing that card a lot, it's just sort of built into the game that that's a card. Whereabad is just a huge tempo swing, losing to cards like that is much more um, impactful. So I understand why the Solarist Marshal isn't nerfed. And as far as Ungolem goes, while it does share the uh, the thing with Tazcad, Kinsman, and Whereabad, where it's in almost every green deck, um, and while it's also kind of upsetting to lose to, like, Solrest Marshal, its power level is much more uh, dictated by the order of cards in your deck, and that sounds kind of weird to say because it's a card game and a lot of how games go is dictated by the order of cards in your deck, but Ungolem is simply a good one-drop by itself, uh, and if you happen to draw a bunch of Brotherhood Assassins in the next couple turns, it can feel extremely overpowering, but if you don't draw them ever, it can feel like, oh, well, you know, I mulliganed for this card, I kept it in my opening hand, and it was a 2-1, which is fine, and maybe you got a good trade or something, or a little bit of damage, but then it really didn't do anything. And in Arena, that's much more of a problem, because the decks are only 30 cards, so it's much more likely to be overpowered. And they might have to think about Arena-specific nerfs in the future, and I'm sure they've thought about that among themselves. But for Constructed, I can see why, you know, Tazcat, immediately powerful. House Kinsman immediately takes over the board, they have to decide whether it's just going to be a 3-3 forever, or they're just going to be behind in life. In Twilight, Moonlight, Werebat, Moonlight, Moonlight, Werebat especially, obviously, the prophecy of the thing means it is very, very powerful immediately, can immediately swing in any sort of aggressive game uh, completely on its head if you have either deck in the game as an aggressive deck, Werebat is extremely powerful. So, not quite... I mean, while Ungolem is obviously very powerful, it's a legendary, just like Tazka, they still want it to be good, and I guess they decided that on average it wasn't good enough, but it is one of those cards that occasionally can be upsetting to lose to. So I understand the nerfs, I think these three nerfs are fantastic, I think all three of these cards are still playable, I, I know Tazka will still be playable, uh, you know, House Kinsman, Whereabout, being 4 twos hurts a little bit because of cards like Lightning Bolt, or excuse me, cards like Firebolt, and uh, even more than that, just the fact that there are two twos in this game, or now two threes, that can trade with the card. Playing a uh, House Kinsman against a 5th Legion trainer was one of the best feelings in the world, because you knew you were going to get a favorable trade, they'd have to put another card into killing it eventually, and then, wouldn't you know it, you're going to gain three life and hit your opponent for three. So, those nerfs really do affect these cards, but I still think they're powerful enough. That explains how powerful they were before the nerfs, but I do think they are still powerful enough to see play. So, now that we've talked about green... Uh, as we can see in the meta snapshot, uh, another like as you can see, a lot of decks do run green. People have mentioned this: midrange archer, ramp scout, action assassin. We pretty much covered those three, right, with the green nerfs, which is a big deal. Uh, another deck that has been extremely powerful in the past is Control Mage. It was tier one in the last snapshot. It was the top of tier one, fallen sort of out of popularity because of the the popularity of the ramp scout. But this is another deck, you know, obviously still incredibly powerful. Bradfordly finished number one legend in uh, October with a version of the deck, and people continue to experiment with it and have success with it. So this is another deck that people have in the past thought might be overpowered. So we have some nerfs that are basically Control Mage specific, although they also, of course, affect certain other decks. We've already seen Control Mage nerfed a little bit in the past with Manticora. <clears throat> Excuse me, gotta stay hydrated. Also talked about that nerf in a past video. But now we see some more uh, control-specific nerfs. Really an experiment to 3 cost. Uh, a little too efficient at 3, it would feel like a real cost to clone your best creature. Uh, especially with Aaron, this can lead to some crazy combos. Could limit design space in the future because if a card gets copied, obviously you can play more than one copy if it's unique. Uh, as a 2 cost, control decks just felt no real problem with jamming 3 into it. This wasn't a thing that was happening a couple months ago, but now you'd be hard pressed to find a control mage deck not running at least 2 copies of this card. So that affects the deck. Elusive Schemer to 3 1, obviously, control mage benefited from having the best cycle in the game. And while, you know, control monk could play Thieves Guild Recruit, control spell sword could play East March Crusader, Disciple of Namira, uh, Elusive Schemer is by itself just the best cycle in the game. All you really have to do is play this card, or pre-nerf, 
play this card, and it's the best cycle in the game. It's still the best cycle in the game, it just trades less efficiently. A 4-drop 3-1, that's a pretty awful stat line for a 4-drop. The only thing really stand out, or the only thing really even decent anymore is the 3-attack, but the, the difference between 3-attack and 4-attack is so huge if you're a control deck and all you're really trying to do with your creatures once they're on the board is trade with your opponent's creatures. Because there are cards like Solarest Marshal and Triumph and Yarl that have 4 toughness that Elusive Schemer simply can't deal with, so playing this on 4 is actually pretty bad for tempo, although pretty great for your card advantage and sustain late into the game if you get another copy into your deck. But the 0 cost 3-1 is obviously still great, so they had to make the 4 cost 3-1 that much worse. Uh, also, we see Nocarine got totally nerfed. Uh, Nocarine and Healing Potion are actually two of the most severe nerfs to the deck, actually. Uh, Nocarine 9 cost, text change to summon draw card, reduces its cost to zero, completely changes the nature of the card. It was capable of some pretty overpowered tempo swings later in the game when you could Nocarine into Odiving, and like I mentioned in the previous video discussing the basic parts of these nerfs, uh, they did reference that it was limiting our future design space too much, because they obviously want to make more cool giant creatures that cost more than 10, but Nocarine allowing you to cheat anything into play immediately for free uh, was kind of a problem. Now you have to get very, very lucky with Nocarine if that's to happen. And I don't think that really... I think the problem with this is that we've talked about how good Mana Ramp is before. Mana, Magicka Ramp in this game, Mana Ramp in other games. In every single game, it's a very hard thing to balance. Cards like Hisgrove do it incredibly well. Cards like Tree Mind do it incredibly well. Nocarine isn't really Ramp, but when I'm talking about Magicka Ramp, I'm also talking about cheating Magicka, like Solarest Marshal. Very hard card to balance correctly. Cards like Nocarine that can make anything cost zero. Now this is, a, this is an effect that possibly just shouldn't exist, so making it that much worse, and you know, where you have to rely on drawing one card out of the 50 cards you're playing, that seems reasonable to me. Nocarine didn't seem overpowered a lot of the time currently, but obviously we have a very small card pool in um, comparison to the card pool we're going to have in the future. So there's no real telling how powerful this effect is, it's totally related to the other cards that are out there. So reducing X Magicka is probably just an effect that they don't want in the game moving forward, and it sucks to see nerfs like this, where it's not like the Moonlight Whereabout that is now slightly worse and in line with other cards' power level, it's just a totally different card basically when you really think about it. However, a nerf this severe on this card is probably warranted, like I'm saying, and it doesn't really affect the Control Mage deck that we know and love too much. There are a very small percentage of games when you go Nocarine into Odoving, and that's like the main use of the card right now. Nocarine into Mana Core, you get an extra body on the war, but it's not really deciding the game whether or not you Nocarine before the Mana Core or you just played Mana Core most of the time. So, a Healing Potion to 2 cost. Uh, I do like this nerf, I think. I think it makes more sense than taking Prophecy off the card. Uh, I do think that uh, heal is still abundant in classes that want it. Werebat was still a fine heal for many. Healing Potion is still a card that I think many control decks will want to play. Pillaging Tribune is good, but you obviously need a board to set up with. They don't want to have too powerful of immediate heal that'll just be played forever and ever in these control decks. Because they are nerfing some more aggressive strategies with this as well, uh, with some of the green nerfs, so it's important. Divine Fervor to find cost mostly impacts aggressive decks. Um, they did mention that token spell sword was winning a little more than they were comfortable with, particularly among newer players. I've mentioned a lot of that deck's very popular on the lower lower levels of the ladder, not because it's not very good higher up, just because it's a deck that you can jam three fervors in and take a lot of wins with. And while that's nice, it's also kind of upsetting, because I've, I've heard a lot of stories of people lower on the ladder saying, oh, well, you know, I thought this game had a very balanced metagame, but I've just played against five token spell sword decks in a row, and I don't really know what to do against Divine Fervor. A lot of people were talking about this card being overpowered. I've mentioned that it's not overpowered in a vacuum, but if they're nerfing all the rest of these cards, makes sense. So, the rest of the things are not... Well, there is one that is actually pretty impactful here. We have Orc uh, Gatekeeper gains props. I'm pretty sure it's Orc Clan Gatekeeper. Uh, the, the three drop 2-2 two, two with guard that buffs something by plus 2 plus 0 when you play it. It now has Prophecy, and additional small buff to Orc decks. What I think this does, actually, is create a huge buff to the aggro Battle Mage deck, which didn't really rate high on the snapshots, so I'm not going to bring it up, but I've seen a ton of it recently. I did an article on Between the Lanes where I talk about uh, the, the variety of decks I played on the ladder the last week of the season. Aggro Battle Mage was one of the most popular aggro decks the last week of last season, and I don't think its popularity is going to go down at all. So I expect to see a lot more of this. I think they might need to look at that deck in the future, uh, perhaps with Burn and Pillage, but I think nerfing the green cards and making Assassin and Archer a little bit less desirable, although still probably fine in the meta and probably Tier 1 and 2, uh, I think that, along with this buff, because the deck runs so many prophecies, 
is going to put Aggro Battle Mage on somewhat of a pedestal for a while. And I think, uh, you know, that's a huge tempo swing when you get a 4-2 guard prophecy at worst, or it can buff something else up for you to counter push, however you see fit. And it's obviously still a fine card from your hand that fits the aggressive theme of the deck. So as it does, it, I mean, it is an orc and it got better, so we can say it is a buff to orcs, but in a, in a more real sense, it's a huge buff to the aggro battle mage deck that we've been seeing a lot, and I don't think that deck's going anywhere, so I'm, I'm likely thinking that we're going to see a nerf to that in the future. Now that I'm thinking about the Soul Rust and the Ungolem nerfs in the context, I've had more time to think about it before I made the video. Now I'm thinking about those more in the context of what they did nerf. Now that this, these are real nerfs that we can talk about. I think it's probably fine to leave those cards alone for now. Uh, the one card I'm sort of worried about moving forward is Burn and Pillage, just because not only we saw the, the slight buff to the decks that do play Burn and Pillage, except for Archer, which got a little worse, but we saw the buff to this. Um, <clears throat> and that could even buff Crusader, even though Divine Fervor got nerfed. Uh, but we don't really have, like, uh, I think Burn and Pillage is far and away the best card in strength. Uh, I think it's sort of on the lines of Fervor, where I liked it where it was for the meta we had, but if so many of these cards are getting nerfed, I think in the future it might need to go to 7 Magic or something. Perhaps not, perhaps I'm just wrong, but I think that might be where we're going. Uh, I do think, as far as metagame is concerned, Assassin and Archer, while they get nerfed, are still fine in the meta. Uh, not nerfing Soul Rest doesn't take away the strongest plays of the deck, which are the double Soul Rest plays, or Soul Rest and other cards. On Golem is still perfectly fine, and obviously these three cards, while not, you know, the same power level they were, are still totally playable. I think Control Mage might have to be a little bit reinvented. Uh, maybe the healing package or the draw package needs to be worked on depending on how the meta is. Maybe you don't even want to play all the package of the Elusive Schemers and Brilliant Experiments if the meta is more aggressive. Can you really afford to play such wildly inefficient cards now? Who knows? It'll be interesting to see what people do with that deck going forward. Worth noting that it's also still kind of unfavored against the, the Histgrove ramp deck, which, while there were a couple green nerfs, didn't really get any nerfs outside of that. Nothing in Endurance got touched, which is important. Uh, Strength actually got some buffs, and I think we might see some additional cool cards being played, such as the Orclan Gatekeeper in the aggressive red decks, Volan Drunk perhaps for some late game. I've seen people play it in Archer before, maybe they'll try to play it again. Overall, I think the nerfs were very good. I think we're looking for a much more balanced meta. When you think about it, you know, three of the decks got, you know, actually all four of the decks that I put in tier one got directly nerfed because obviously Aggro Token Crusader Divine Fervor is a huge part of that deck. Uh, while I think it's still a fine deck, probably, uh, you know, all four of the decks that I put in tier one, or that, 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 all, that all the BTL snapshot contributors, including myself, put in tier one, got nerfed. Uh, that does put things on a more even playing field, and even a lot of the tier 2 decks got a little bit worse, so it'll be really interesting to see how the decks that didn't get touched, you know, react to this, what decks emerge. I think we're looking for a very solid meta moving forward. I think Burn and Pillage is probably the only card that I think might be needing to be touched in the future coming weeks. But obviously that depends on how the meta actually shakes up. So what are your thoughts on these nerfs? Feel free to leave a comment on the video below. Thank you for watching. If you've watched all of this, it's a pretty long video. I had no idea how it was going to go. Uh, no script or anything. So hopefully you enjoyed my take on these nerfs. I think Direwolf did a fantastic job. If you're watching this on Between the Lanes, feel free to check out the YouTube channel. Subscribe for more videos. If you're watching this on the YouTube channel, check out Between the Lanes for the meta snapshot and more strategy articles. And I'll see you next time, guys.